Welcome to the Michigan State University Apicultural Extension Beekeeping Webinar Series. This webinar, Established Colonies Early Season Management, is designed for beekeepers who have overwintered colonies and are looking for some guidance for the first steps of bringing them out of winter and to start the new season. This webinar is brought to you by your MSU Apiculture team, a group of specialist technicians and educators who are here to help you with your bees. We'll cover a variety of topics on our agenda tonight. First, we'll define what we mean by early spring. We'll look at early season management tasks for colonies that are either dead, small, or already booming. We'll identify common pitfalls and give you a task list for success. Dr. Adam and Gray is going to lead us off on the first topic defining what we mean by early spring. First, we've got this period of time between the start of brood rearing and the last frost of the season. Now, we don't know exactly when brood rearing starts, but it's generally sometime in January or February. Now, you'll also notice that during this time of year, we have these, well, these beautiful pictures that you see here that we see very often of these flowers that are included in snow. And so we have crocuses that are oftentimes flowering and we still get snowfall during that time. But in generally, what this time period is characterized is by warm days and cold nights. So we still get that warm up during the day, but we're still cold in the nighttime, oftentimes well under freezing. It's also a period of time that's characterized by intermittent food. So there is food available, but it's, it's, not, it's not completely available. There's still scarcity around. Now, the big thing that we all are really, really wanting to do right now, we have these lovely days that things warm up, everybody really wants to get digging in their beehives. And that is really something that we have to resist against because early spring really is a whole complex period of time for us here in Michigan. And when we actually think about what spring is, as we go to this next slide, um, we can really see that in fact, here in Michigan, we have like 11 seasons, really, when you think about it. We come out of winter and then we've got this fool spring where, oh boy, we have that first 50 degree day outside of winter and all of us are running around in t-shirts and shorts trying to get some sun. Well, we always see that that dips right back down into kind of this second winter period. Um, and then we can obviously get another warm up there where we may have several weeks where things are very warm and, and we can call that the spring of deception. And then, well, we could get another winter after that where we get snowfall again. So, you know, I would say this early season period in Michigan, it's, it's very deceptive and it's, it can be characterized by multiple things. We get these warm up and cool downs and we really have to understand that when we first start seeing those early signs of spring, that it's really not the time to start digging into beehives because we have a lot of things still going on there in the environment as far as temperature changes. So this, this period of time, really, you can think about it, is like a holding period. So there is brood growth, but there's really not much activity other than that outside of the hive. And during this period, there's no wax being drawn. There's very little house cleaning taking place. And most of the bees that are involved in the hive are involved in nursing and care for the brood. Now, it's a priority at this time of, of year for the brood because well, the, the size of the brood nest is kind of limited by temperature, and the temperature of that brood it has to stay above 90 degrees in order to not get chilled. So most of the time, the bees that are inside of the colony, they really are, are, are really focused on keeping that, that brood nest warm. Um, and as bees emerge and the weather gets warmer, that brood nest is going to start expanding. Um, and again, I just want to draw your attention to this photo here. You know, Flowers are blooming oftentimes when we have, when we have snowfall. So um, we have to be careful about what we're doing uh, with the colonies at this time. All right, so really in, in spring, you can think about this in, in this early portion of spring, you can really think of beekeeping as more of an art than a science. There's really no right date for us or, or temperature that we can just tell you um, where you should do things, right? Because it's so variable in Michigan. And, you know, I've lived here for now, uh, this is my uh, seventh year living in Michigan. And it seems like every single spring is entirely different than the spring before it. So to feel like you're gonna have this plan right on a date, you know, 
it, it, it's kind of, you're setting yourself up for failure. So what you really need to be doing is you need to watch how your bees are building up during this time and, and how they're getting fed in response to food and temperature. And so by, you know, when we think about this, we have about a month left, um, you know, we, well, even more so than that. We've got several, potentially several weeks, of, even a couple months left of this period. So we just need to make sure that we are being careful with our bees and understanding what's going on as far as the resources that are coming in and not getting hung up like, okay, today's the day I'm going to start doing something. And I think that really goes back to always being flexible with your bees and being able to attend to them when they need things, not so much when you, things are convenient for you. All right, so this really is a, is a good example. So you really need to know your area. Part of your responsibility as a beekeeper and as a farmer is to really get to know your environment and know what signals to look for when things are changing. Now, in certain communities, you can kind of get a sense of when your last frost date's gonna be. So like, for example, in Jackson County, this might be around you know, May 10th or, or usually. And so that's something that you can kind of think about in a loose frame of mind um, to, to keep in your mind. But again, don't get hung up on exact dates. What we really want to be focused on is the blooms. We want to be focused on what is flowering in the landscape. And so you being observant of what's going on in the landscape is going to be a much more powerful tool for you than some, cal some date on a calendar. And so that's a really important part of you being a good beekeeper is understanding what's going on in your landscape. Now, the first blooms of the season that we oftentimes see in Michigan, and this is pretty, pretty consistent, um, and this will be right on the next slide as it's coming up here, are your first trees that are going to really come out are your willows and your maples. And when I have folks that ask me, well, how do I tell when things are blooming? Well, you look, right? You, you got to look at the bud break that's happening on these trees. And when you're looking at woodlots, if you're just passing down the road and you glance over into a woodlot and you see this tinge of red up in the canopy, that's an indication that you have maples that are starting to push. If you see more yellow colors, that's an indication that your willows are starting to push. Now, skunk cabbage is another resource that's out there uh, for bees during this time. But keep in mind that these are not nectar-rich resources. They're primarily pollen-rich resources. Um, and that allows for brood to grow, but they're not growing at such a rapid rate that they're going to be crowding in these colonies at this period of time. Now, actual spring is characterized by degree days that allow plants to start really growing and pushing at a very consistent rate. Now, when I talk about degree days to folks, I kind of describe it as this Goldilocks zone. So you can see on this graph that when we get in this bottom area below the lower temperature threshold, plants are not really growing. When we get above the temperature threshold, the upper threshold, plants are really not growing. But that middle area where we accumulate what we call degree days, that's where things are really starting to happen. And both insects and plants respond to degree days by growing and reproducing. So warmer nights, really when we're getting into that actual spring, what we're talking about is warm nights and food coming in reliably. And that reliable source of food in those warmer nights, more degree days equals larger colony growth. Thanks, Adam. Now Dan Wines is gonna lead us through what we do with colonies that are dead at this time of year. So just in, you know, in working with bees, you know, monitoring bee forums the last, you know, couple months, we get a lot of, you know, a lot of calls. People have, people have lost colonies through the winter. You know, you get a warm day in February, you go out and look, a couple colonies are flying. One is we can pop a lid, nobody's home, they're all dead. Um, so, but maybe some of you, if you haven't been out there yet, um, you know, it's a, it's a good time to go and check if they're alive, um, you know, and, and kind of see what you're dealing with. We're, so when you do find a colony that, that is dead, we're going to kind of talk about that because there are some things you can potentially learn by examining it dead out. Um, we're not going to go, I mean, there's whole, you know, myself and others have given whole hour long talks exclusively on why did my bees die? Like that, that's a very deep topic. We're just gonna kind of touch on some potentially obvious things you might see and things you can learn. Like this photo, this example of this tiny little, you know, fist sized cluster, this queen there, you can see, um, ultimately the, those last couple hundred bees in that colony died from the cold, but it, it's more of a question of what resulted in them shrinking down to a, a level where there was only a couple. So if we're looking at root causes, 
you know, we're not going to say this really colony died from the cold. Bees generally don't die from the cold, but there was an underlying cause that happened well before this that led to this state. Um, so one of the things when, when you do encounter a dead out and say it, it, it does kind of pay to take your time and go through it a little bit and look because you, you, you can learn some things from it potentially. Um, you know, there are certain clues that'll, that'll maybe give you an idea of what, what led to its dem demise. Um, if you do look in the brood nest, if you have, you know, any remaining brood, um, you know, this photo, this is an example of something as, as beginning beekeepers don't necessarily know to look for or would, would recognize that they see it. But, but these kind of white crystals in the top of the cells are frass from varroa mites. It's their feces. Um, and if you see that, particularly in like the amount that's in this photo, that, that's, a, that's a really clear indication that this colony was under tremendous mite pressure, um, that likely that's been the kind of the core stressor that's, that's led to their demise. Um, you know, as, as you're going through the colony, just kind of things to keep in mind, observations to make. You know, are, are you seeing a lot of dead bees? Are, are there a few? Is there kind of nobody home? Um, does it look like the dead bees have freshly dead or are they kind of all moldy and did they die in the winter and, you know, several months ago and you're just finding them now? Um, so these are the kind of things you want to be looking at. Um, another thing that's, I guess, important to stress it in going through this um, kind of exam is you're not always going to arrive at an answer. Some are very clear cut, like if you see um, brass like this, that's a good indication. Other times you just kind of have to shrug, you learn what you can learn. And, um, you know, some colonies die, that's, that's the nature of it. Um, this is another, this is a pretty clear cut case um, here. This is starvation, um, where you've got this, a whole bottom board full of bees. Clearly there was a lot of bees there. They have not been dead for very long. Um, you know, you see in the combs, you see bees in cells and that, that in conjunction with a lot of dead bees, kind of freshly dead uniform timing on the bottom board. Um, is, is pretty clear cut on starvation. We're gonna talk a little bit about that as we go into preventing that in the actual still living colonies in the, in the subsequent sections, but that's what a starvation death looks like. Um, so when you do encounter these dead outs, you do a little bit of, you know, kind of forensic, see what you can learn from it, take some notes. Um, and then the next task basically is you wanna clean up the equipment, um, kind of salvage what's left. Um, and the main task in doing this, like things like scraping bottom boards, we, we kind of want to ease the workload. We're going to reuse that equipment, whether it's we're going to split back onto it and reuse it, or we're going to repopulate with a new kind of package. We kind of want to clean out, you know, bottom boards and things like that. They don't need to be sterilized. Um, like a bottom board's not a real um, high probability of a disease transmission, but we don't want to leave a bunch of wet moldy stuff there either that's extra work and it's a burden that the bees have to take care of. So just general good cleaning things up, petting things up. Um, when you find um, like comb like this, that's got a bunch of bees kind of, you know, buried in it, that that's where they've died you don't need to worry about like cleaning out all those bees. Um, if you try to shake them out or pick them out, you, you're going to end up doing more damage to the comb than anything. Um, and when you, if you have a frame like that, it can be put, you know, on a strong hive kind of as a project. They, they will clean it out. I mean, the bees do clean their colony. It's kind of part of the natural in hive task. So if you have something like that where the comb itself, the wax is in good shape and you want to reuse it, don't worry about picking all those individual bees out. That's something a, a good strong colony can take care of without too much of a burden. So we've got these now boxes of frames that we're kind of dealing with and you kind of want to make an assessment of which colonies or, or sorry which frames should be culled and the, the kind of mentality that could help you make that decision, um, I have a, a colleague who uses the term the ick test. If, so, if something looks, if it looks gross, if it looks moldy, if it's fermented, um, that's not something you want to put back onto a hive, you know, and it's, you're giving, your bees may be able to clean it up, but that's, that's putting up kind of a high burden, a high workload on them. Um, so, there's a couple kind of criteria for selecting those frames you want to get rid of. Um, like 
old pollen frames. Um, they can be full of pesticides, pathogens. Um, dead brood frames, to be cautious, brood does have some bacterial diseases and things. If you want to be certain, any frames that have kind of remnants of dead brood on them are good candidates for culling. Anything that's been, you know, chewed on by mice or the, the wax is really, you know, dark and you've got fur comb and brace comb and, and it's just kind of physically a mess. Um, and if you've got those things that are kind of moldy and, and gross, you look at pollen or something else in the colony, that doesn't really look clean. That's going to stress my bees out if I put that in a healthy colony. Um, so here, you know, this is a pretty, this, this is not a borderline case. I mean, if you see something like this, hopefully this will, you would call this well before you get to this point, but that's kind of an extreme example of, you know, over the years, the comb darkens, the bees build some fur comb, they got drone comb in there. It's just something like that's gonna be a, you know, that old dark comb's a repository for you know, pathogens and pesticides. And just in trying to get that frame out of the box, you're gonna struggle to get it out without damaging the next frame, without squishing bees. So that's, that's a great candidate for the burn pile. Um, this here is an example of frame that's kind of full of old pollen. It's kind of real shiny and glossy looking. Um, and it, it doesn't, you think of pollen, you know, always say we talk about pollen being an important resource for the colony when they're bringing it in this time of year. That's really exciting because at least the colony growth. But when we've got kind of this old stuff, it's been sitting around all winter. The, the protein breaks down. It doesn't have the nutritional value to the bees. It can be a reservoir for pesticides in the colony. It's something that's going to attract pests, um, you know. So when you have these full frames like this, it's it's better to get rid of them if the, you know if you've kind of carried them through the winter. They're a good candidate to be culled out. Um, and anything with that has dead brood in it, like this is a picture again from like a, a colony that's died through dwindle. You know, there's a few little scraps of brood that's been neglected basically as the as the population of adults shrunk down to the point where they couldn't care for it. Um, that could be something you'd want to get rid of. If there, there potentially could be, you know, bacteria or something in there. So usually frames with that brood are a good, good candidates to be cold as well. So now we've kind of talked through as you've got these boxes or boxes full of frames from your colonies. Those are the ones you want to get rid of. Now you're probably going to encounter if that colony, if it's early enough, the colony hasn't been robbed out um, and they didn't die from starvation you're likely going to have frames that are you know at least partially full of honey um and so a lot of questions can we use that honey on other hives and the answer yes you can use that on other hives um there is always a little risk of disease transmission um moving stuff between hives honey can have um, you know carry pathogens and spores in it um but it's as long as you bear that in mind um Typically, colonies that die from American fowl brood, which is a spore-producing bacteria, um, if a colony's infected with that, it's likely not going to produce a lot of honey to the point where you're going to have this surplus or leftover from the dead colony to distribute. Um, so, when you've got these honey frames from your brood box, not a problem to say you're going to be making splits from your survivors. You may be repopulating, so it's good to put those starting out colonies uh, so they have some frames of honey to just kind of help them along. Um, common question we get is, well, can I extract all that honey that I have? Um, you know, I went out and found my, my dead colony and, and um, can I harvest the honey out of that? Um, simple answer is, is it's it's not not really a great option for for a number of different reasons um particularly if it's it's from your brood nest you know depending on the mite treatments you've used um those those can contaminate honey um if you if you fed it all in the fall some of that actually what you you know consider honey is is sourced from syrup not nectar so it wouldn't kind of be a, a pure product um you know if it's been sitting around dead out in the bee yard for any length of time. It may be contaminated from, you know, just kind of sick bees, may have mice in it. Um, and then if it's also been sitting around all winter, it's probably gonna be granulated. It's definitely gonna be cold. It's not really gonna um, be easy to extract out of, out of those frames anyways. Um, so one aspect where this comes up is when people have um, kind of these big towers in the spring 
And really that, that's a function of, um, you know, improper management in the fall. You know, we, we talk about thinking of this, this, this hive is, it's a stack of boxes that changes size over the season, but really it's two separate portions down below, whether you do it in two boxes or three boxes, that's kind of your animal. And that's what it's going to overwinter as. That's what it should come through in the spring. And then you've got your supers on top. That's your crop. That's what you're putting those boxes on in the spring and taking off in the fall. So again, that's not, you shouldn't really get to a situation where you have a big tall colony like this through the fall. If you do, best case is probably going to be to try to use up some of that honey when you do make the splits or you repopulate and kind of give it back to the bees. It's not sort of best for human consumption at that point. Um, so then you're probably going to have, you know, you can't do this immediately, you know, you're going out, sorting through frames, picking up your dead outs, cleaning them up. Um, you're going to have some equipment that's probably going to need to be stored before it gets used. And this applies now, but it also applies if you have something and, and, you know, that's died earlier on, pre-winter, a couple months ago, um, where you're going to be storing it for a you know, significant period of time, weeks to months. Um, cold is a good thing. Um, generally, it, it slows down any issues with fermentation and it, and it you know, kind of slows the growth of different pathogens and things like that. Um, so outdoor storage is good, you know, a, a shed or a garage unheated, that's completely fine. Um, you do have stuff's gonna be outdoors. You do kind of want to protect it from the elements, any sort of rain or snow, you know, beekeeping equipment's not cheap. Um, you know, woodware rots um, a lot quicker if it's consistently out in the elements. Also, you know, getting moisture into things, it's just gonna promote fermentation and growth of bacteria and things like that. So. So keeping things at least under cover, under shelter, um, you know, that could be under a lean-to or say an unheated storage building. It could be just stacking things up in kind of a, a B-tight setting. You see this picture on the right. Um, you've got, you know, there's hardware cloth underneath there and then the boxes are stacked very neatly. So they are B-tight. So there's not gonna be bees getting in, robbing anything. There's also not gonna be any mice getting in. You see on these pictures on the left, the two there, that kind of shows what, what mice will will do to a hive. They'll make a mess of it. They'll chew up your wax. They'll ruin your frames. So kind of, you know, as you're storing it, um, just kind of keep that protection um, in mind. So we could take a couple questions on the dead outs if we've got some before we move on to kind of happier scenarios. Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, so Barry asks, can frames which are going to be called, if you have plastic foundation, can they be power washed and reused? Do you want to answer about how to reuse um, plastic frames, Dan? Yeah, so you can kind of scrape them back to the foundation. I, I've not done power washing myself. I've heard others do it. I, I think the one thing that's really going to kind of up your chance for success and to have the bees draw out that comb nicely again to kind of nice sheets of worker cells is to re-wax it after you clean it off because there's going to be little bits of debris in that so if it's not a nice clean sheet that you know is equivalent to foundation they may draw it out in a bunch of weird bird comb and, and drone comb and, and that so that would be my one um you know thing to improve your chance of success is, is to clean it well and get a lot of wax back onto it before putting it back in a hive I, I agree, and you can definitely coat it pretty heavily with wax before you put it in. Um, there's a question from Adam's section about what you would consider a warm night. Does that just mean above freezing? Adam, do you want to take that, or do you want me to field it? You know, normally what I consider a warm night is kind of in the 40s and above. Um, that's generally what I mark. I mean, above freezing, we're getting into the kind of the thaw stage. But for me personally, the 40 degrees is kind of when I consider things warmered up. Yeah. And I don't, the really big difference about the, the warm term is that it's functional. So if you've got a big cluster, then, you know, they can do a lot of activities besides keeping the brood nest warm. That's what we're looking for is can they do other things besides warming brood? So if you've got a little cluster, even if it's 40, they may still be all on duty. Um, but we're looking for when they can kind of relax a little and go do other things. And Megan, I had one clarifying question from the Facebook group. Um, 
Dan had used the term burr and brace comb, and we had uh, Gary just wanted some clarification on what he meant by that comb type. Okay, yeah, I, those sorts of, essentially I use those terms to mean anything that's not, um, it's not a nice, clean, straight sheet, you know, with, with all the frames being, you know, modular, they all fit together nicely. When they're nicely drawn out, you can pull individual frames out. They're not, they're not connected to each other. There's not extra comb sticking off them that when you pull it out, it's going to damage the frame next to it. Like that first example of the call frame I showed that was just this really dark, that had a lot of burr comb. It was kind of surplus to the normal single sheet. Um, so it's, it's just kind of a term for irregular contours, oddities, things like that, that which functionally for the bees, not a problem, but us as beekeepers and wanting to be able to get in and, and work hives without damaging bees and, and other combs, um, that, that's kind of what I mean by that burr comb and brace comb. All right, and then one last question that's dead out related is what is the best way to keep wax moths out of empty stored brood comb? And I think maybe do you want to talk about now and then you can maybe just briefly talk about in the future? Yeah, so so this time of year, it's it's typically not a problem um, because of temperature. I say in this, this is an aspect where cold is your friend. Um, the wax moth aren't really going to infest your, your comb this time of year. Um, one of the recommendations for, you know, warmer season, um, it, if you freeze that comb for, I believe it's like 24 to 48 hours, if you can freeze that comb, that's gonna kill any eggs that are in uh, those frames. And then you can kind of bag it up in an airtight, you know, a hefty bag or something like that to kind of prevent reinfestation. Um, but that, that's one way to deal with it in a warmer time of year is just a pre-freeze and then exclusion. Yep, but th this time, of year, so we don't have to deal with Max Moss in July or in Michigan until basically July. Okay, so we're gonna talk about booming beehives. So we've gone from the dismal dead outs to something that's a little overwhelming. <laughs> when, you, when you open up a hive, it's a great sign, but you have this gigantic group of bees just staring right back at you. Um, you know, the one thing to think about when you have booming colonies this time of the year, that these are colonies that are really big enough to keep the brood nest warm and to start bringing in incoming nectar as soon as it's available. Now, the one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're dealing with booming hives like this is these are going to be your hives that are likely to swarm. So you need to make sure that as resources start coming on in the landscape, that you are prepared for the space that's gonna be necessary for this colony to expand and not get bottled up to where they're going to end up swarming. Now, if we go to the next slide, what we're talking about, um, really when we're talking about this idea of swarm risk, is that when, when, bees are, when bees are storing nectar as it's coming in, there needs to be space for that. And if there is not enough space above the brood nest directly, the bees will actually store nectar in the brood chamber. And we call that backfilling, where they're actually backfilling the area that should be brood and they're putting nectar in it. And essentially what that ends up happening is we get this competition for space between the workers and the queen. And the, as the queen doesn't have enough room to lay, that is one of the signals as we start diluting in brood pheromone and, queen pher and the idea of queen pheromone gets diluted in these big, big robust hives, we start running the risk of swarming. Those are some swarm impulses that we see. So how do we avoid any of this kind of stuff? You know, as we have these big booming colonies that are coming out of the winter, we want to make sure that we, you know, we got all these big colonies through the winter. We want to take advantage of our good success of, of getting these larger colonies through the winter. So what you really need to do right now or during this time of season as we're seeing resources coming in is we need to add space directly above the brood nest. So in this example, and, and, and just to be clear, we're not messing with the brood nest itself. We're just adding space above it. So this is a really great example where we see these two images here, the light purple brood box at the bottom, and then we've got this darker purple brood box with the yellow cluster in the middle of it. So 
you know, one of the things that you see here is that the brood nest has moved up over the course of the winter. We're in this second detox, but we need to add that space directly above the brood chamber. Now, the thing that you can, it doesn't have to necessarily be mediums. You know, we're, we're saying supering, and I know a lot of folks get hung up on the, the idea that a super is a medium. This can be deeps, it can be mediums. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter. You just are adding space. The big things that do matter is that you have drawn comb because you want the bees to be able to store those resources as soon as they come in so that you don't run the risk of them filling that brood chamber with a whole bunch of nectar and, and, and pollen resources and really squeezing out the queen and, and getting your bees to actually uh, have, the, have a swarm impulse um, to start that swarm process. So things that you should be considering though is that really when we're talking about supering, really we're only, um, we're only putting supers on colonies that, that don't need feed. So you're not going to be feeding colonies that, that are in this situation because then you're just going to be adding more pressure on that space. So by definition, they only need room for nectar if the food is coming in. So when we're saying we're going to be supering, you have to realize that that is the time when we start seeing nectar coming in and they're going to start storing those re uh, food resources. So you also, you know, you have to consider that there sometimes you can have situations where a hive could still starve. And in this situation, we have a hive that maybe has been light and that we've been feeding. So you can see this colony right here, the bees, we, ha we have actually been feeding them supplemental feed. So they are completely out of resources in this colony right now. And we need to be feeding them because they are light. Um, so there is also kind of this art of knowing when to feed. So if you have colonies like in the first one that we showed that are very robust, maybe they're bringing resources in, that is, that is not a colony we would normally feed. But in this situation, if we had a colony that we knew had been light for a very long time and we had had to supplementally feed, it's, it's very likely that we're still going to need to feed them in order so that they do not starve in place while they're starting to rear brood. And so this is a time and place when you actually, you know, if you do need to continue feeding these colonies, you can feed them sugar water uh, at this time, uh, sugar syrup. Uh, and that'll be in just our, our next slide there. Um, yeah, so you can feed sugar syrup at this point in time. Again, we talked about the bucket feeding method um, in the last lecture. So that is one of your options uh, as far as when to be, or what you can do for feed uh, for those particular colonies. So many colonies are not gonna be fed. Um, there is really no should for feeding. Um, it's really all you being able to interpret the signs of what's going on in the landscape, what's going on with your bees. You know, one of the things I always encourage um, folks that I work with is when you get these really nice days and you're really chomping at the bit to, to get in those beehives, sit in front of your hives and just spend some time watching what they're bringing in. And you'll get a real good sense of what's going on in the landscape just from the activity of your bees coming and going. And that also goes along with watching your blooms and, and the foraging weather. So, you know, if you have not started downloading a weather app on your phone and are watching the weather every single day to see what your bees are going to be doing as far as are they going to be flying, or are we going to be going back into cold, that's something I would recommend you do. Um, bees will start bringing in their own food when the resources are available. Um, and if the hive, if the weather is bad and hives are light, so if it is, if it is a really bad weather, and you know, like last year, I remember we had a really wet spring. If we have a wet spring you, and you have light hives, you are going to need to supplementally feed them because they cannot get out in the landscape to get their resources. So really, it comes back to you being a good beekeeper and interpreting what's going on in the landscape and the needs of your bees. Awesome, Adam. Okay, I have a couple questions on booming colonies coming in. So one of the questions is related to feeding. So with you, these big booming colonies, if you do feed them protein, is that going to push them towards a swarm? Well, it's just gonna, it's, we're gonna end up having more brood come on if more protein is available. And so as we make those protein resources available, if you've got a big booming colony, they're likely gonna be pretty good on their own. Um, but if you, if you start feeding them more and more supplemental pollen, that could start pushing the, that, uh, that kind of swarm impulse a little bit more if brood rearing starts to accelerate. Excellent. And then there's a clarification on the um, sh sugar syrup. So even though our current nighttime temps are not 40 plus degrees, we can still use sugar water? 
Yeah, the sugar water is not going to freeze. Um, it, it actually will, will not freeze even below freezing. Um, it, it has a pretty good ability to, to stay in liquid form. So you're okay in this period of time. The big thing to keep in mind with feeders, though, especially top feeders, is that you want to make sure that they are not leaking. Because if, you, if that vacuum breaks and that whole bunch of sugar water dumps down onto your bees, that will still freeze out your bees when we get into these cold temperatures. Excellent. And then again on the bucket feeding, when bucket feeding is inside the hive, are spacers required between the inner cover and the bucket to elevate the bucket? Or if you want to just talk about how those buckets work. Yeah, so essentially we, what your inner cover has a hole in the middle of it, um, kind of a handhold there. And so normally you're just going to place it right on top of that hole. Um, there's no spacer that you're adding or anything like that. It is literally just right on the inner cover um, between the, the you li li literally on top of the hive body right below it. So just like you would normally have an inner cover on your top of your hive body and then you would put a top cover, you just put the feeder right on that inner cover. Excellent. And then um, there's some questions that I want to answer because they're on my pet topic on the early spring, <laughs> if that's okay. <laughs> um, yes completely all right <laughs> okay so someone said that um how do we know if we need to add space if we can't get in to look inside the hive yet and so you can and then there's also a question how can we tell if they need feed if it's too cold to open the hive what temperature can you open boxes to check the amount of honey left over from winter so i'm going out and looking in like lifting up the lid and lifting the back of the hive in the winter time as long as it's not like a day during a blizzard lifting the lid off the colony to peak is not going to be a big deal if i lift the lid off and i peek down and i see that there is a huge cluster of bees then those are going to be the ones that are going to get supers so when we talk about not digging in there the big difference is not necessarily that you can't even crack open the hive it's really that you don't want to be lifting out frames and really disrupting the bees, making them have to do a lot of cleanup work and exposing the brood um, to the outer temperature. And then there's one last question, Adam, which I'm gonna open up to the panel if you wanna do your first, because we actually never talked about this in our, um, our pre-meeting, but at which point do you take your quilting boxes and wraps off your hives? Oh, that's a really good uh, question. Um, the, the, I think the for me, um, there's really no exact time. I mean, you can leave quilt boxes and moisture boards on all season long if you forgot about them. I, they're not going to have any detrimental effect to your hive. Um, so I would say be cautious about not taking them off too early. Um, you, it's not really that you, can, that you can take them off too late, but rather that you could remove them too early. So make sure that you're in good weather before you start thinking about taking those out. As long as those bees are clustering um, at some point in time, they are putting off a lot of humid air in that hive. So that's how I approach that. I wholeheartedly agree. If I actually get out to, to wrap my hives for the winter, I won't take them off until I'm doing splits which is you know, going to be weeks from now. So even though it feels like we wanna be good in like taking off extra layers, um, just leave them on there. It's better to just leave them on there for longer. All right, so those are all the related questions. Um, oh, one last one is, if you over super a booming colony, at what point do you address the empty bottom brood chamber? That is what we're going to talk about in the next one. So when we're putting on these supers, this is basically just to get us into swarm season and to when things really pick up. So these kind of putting boxes on top of big colonies is only going to be a position they're in for maybe even a week or two. Great. Well, I'm going to talk about the small colonies that make it through the winter. So when I'm talking about a small colony, I mean a colony that is small and stays small throughout the spring. Uh, and it's likely to have a diminished or a delayed urge to swarm. So a really small colony in the spring is one that we're not concerned about swarming at this point. Um, a small colony isn't able to devote a lot of bees to foraging tasks, so they might not be able to bring in much food in the spring. Here's an example of a small cluster. So there's a photo with a small amount of bees um, in between the top and the bottom box. Uh, you don't have to evaluate cluster size right now, 
Um, it can be something that you wait to do on a warmer day later in the season. If you do evaluate the cluster size, you should avoid inspecting frames. So we're trying not to pull up frames and inspect them right now. Uh, but you can evaluate the cluster size by looking at the top and the bottom of the frames. So when we're doing cluster counts, we look at all, um, all the boxes where the bees are clustered and we look at the tops of the frames and the bottoms of the frames to gauge the size of the cluster. Um, so at this time of year, you should avoid messing with your bees too much. The colony does not heat the entire hive, but they do need to maintain the brood nest at above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you really want to do bee work, a lot of people ask about reversals. So the purpose of reversals is to give the bees drawn comb above the brood nest. Uh, and reversals are okay as long as you don't split the brood nest. So this diagram shows a textbook example of a reversal where the yellow circle represents the brood nest. And we have two boxes and the brood nest is entirely in the top box. And so these boxes can be reversed without splitting the brood nest. And this is, uh, re reversals are often a common type of advice that are given to beekeepers coming with overwintered colonies in the spring, but there are many examples and cases where that don't fit this textbook example. Um, so in this, this example, we reverse the boxes and then the entire brood nest would be in the bottom and it would have an empty box of drawn frames in the top box. It's common, however, to find the brood nest split between multiple boxes. If the boxes are reversed, then you will split the brood nest. The bees may not be able to keep both areas of brood warm during cold nights, and some of the brood may become chilled and died. And die. So here you can see if we were to reverse a hive that had brood nest in between two boxes, it would be split between the two boxes. So you don't want to give supers to really small colonies. If your small colony's brood nest is entirely in the top box, you have an opportunity to sort through unused frames and do a reversal. You can move the box with the brood nest at the bottom, to the bottom board and then place a box of nice frames on top of it. You can sort through the colony's unoccupied frames and cull old or bad frames. So here in the diagram, we're doing a reversal because in this example, the, the brood nest is entirely in the top box. So we can take that colony's bottom box and use it as an opportunity to sort through those frames that are not in use. And we can move the brood nest to the bottom, right above the, the bottom board. And then we can give it a top box with nice frames. Reversals aren't necessary for colonies that have drawn comb above the brood nest. You can do reversals if it is really night, a nice day and you're looking for some bee work to do. Make sure you don't break up the brood nest. Ideally, you should sort through boxes that don't have brood to cull fold frames. All right, if you left your hive taller than three deeps, you may not want to add more space to the hive. You can do a reversal if it's obvious where the brood nest is and if you can rearrange the hive without splitting the brood nest. In general, we're trying to encourage people to overwinter their hives in spaces that are three deeps or smaller worth of space. Small colonies may not have enough foragers to bring back pollen and nectar, regardless of the amount available outside of the hive. You should evaluate food stores in the hive and feed protein patties and sugar syrup as needed. So for small, small colonies don't have extra workers. In a strong hive, the ratio of bees to brood may be three to one, where small colonies may have a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning there are no extra bees to forage or do housework. Wisconsin scientists found that a colony of 1,500 bees had 11,850 brood cells, or 79% as many cells as bees, while a colony with 30,000 bees had 18,300 cells of brood, or 60%. A 60,000 bee colony had 15,000 brood cells, or 25% as many brood cells as bees. So we thought those would be some interesting examples for you all. We also thought you might really appreciate those scientists that counted all of those brood cells, bees. All right. Um, do we have time for questions, Megan, before the next section? Yeah, I think so. And there's a couple that came in. Um, so 
there, there was a question about when the, the cluster diameter and you gave it in frames. Um, but if you want to just kind of talk a little bit, he says, what cluster diameter is needed for you to determine that the colony like would be split or if it qualifies as this small one? Yeah, so we as beekeepers often talk about colonies in terms of frames of bees. And that isn't, we're not counting just the number of frames that the bees are on. We're kind of reimagining the bees to imagine how many frames they would fill if they were all covering the frames. So um, to split a colony, let's see, I, I normally like at least like a few, so personally me, and then I'll let the other panelists respond. I want to be in a situation where my parent colony has three to four frames of brood and my split has three to four frames of brood. Um, what are other people's thoughts on that? I, I would agree of having about three to four frames of brood in each one. Um, it basically, I would like to split it into at least at minimum something that I would want to buy. You know, so if I'm going to buy a five frame nuke with three frames of brood, that would be like kind of the minimum split that I would get. Um, there's a question about if your hive is wrapped, can you still take the bed, dead bees on the bottom board out? I have a lot of dead bees on the bottom board, but couldn't get to them without taking off my wrap. Yeah, so I guess maybe that depends on what kind of wrap you're using. Um, so some of the wraps come off and go back on really easily. Some of them, if it's tar paper, for example, you might have to restaple it, but it's perfectly fine to unwrap the hive on a nice day um, scrape the dead bees off the bottom board and then rewrap it. Yeah, it's also perfectly fine to just leave it alone. Hopefully your bees um, usually will have an upper entrance that they can get out. If the bees are trapped in there, then you want to do it, but it's not something that has to be done um, now as well. Um, what should you do if your brood is split between an upper and lower brood box? Just leave them alone and not reverse? So that's where you would normally do what Adam was talking about, where you are putting supers on them. So if you have a brood box split between two boxes, you don't want to reverse them, but you can give them empty drawn frame or empty drawn comb above the brood nest by putting supers on them early. All right, and then um, the one last question, or actually, and then there was a question related to that topic is if you should put a queen excluder above the brood box, before you add those supers, um, you can do, you can put a, a queen excluder on there. Again, remember it has to be drawn comb. Um, usually what I do is just put a box of deep above it or put brood frames above it so that if the bees do choose to move up and lay in it, I don't care because I'm gonna break it down and make my splits with them later. All right. And then the last question on this topic, Tony is itching to get into his bees. And he says, can we reverse bee boxes now in Southeast Michigan if our colonies are booming and in the top box now and we're supplemental feeding and they're in two deeps and one medium? So if there's a box that doesn't have any of the brood nests in it, you could reverse it. But if it's a booming colony and the brood nest is big and in more all of your boxes, then you shouldn't reverse it. Yeah, and I think like the reason we included reversals in here is like for really it is for small colonies. There is a lot of people think that you have to do a reversal and they're pushed really hard on the internet. Um, but just remember like you are rearranging the brood nest. So it's not something that you really have to do. And in most cases, you really don't need, yeah, you don't need to do it to most colonies. Um, but if you've got a really, really obvious situation where all the bees are up top, um, you could do this. Um, how about when you remove your mouse guards? Can you do them now? Yes. Is that what you say? Yeah, I mean, I, you can do them now. I, I do kind of treat this period, like, n keep in mind that we will be breaking down and completely disassembling and, like, doing a ton of work on our colonies in just a few weeks. Um, so I think the the least amount of work that you can do till that point is pretty good. But um, we do have a beekeeper who said they jumped the gun, already took the wraps off, and took empty supers off. Um, do you have advice for them?
So you could put the wrap back on. It's probably not something that's going to make a huge difference to your hive though at this point in time. It's not something I would lose sleep over. Agreed. All right, that's the end of my questions. Great, I'm going to talk about pitfalls. All right, so to, we're going to talk about starvation, tracheal mites, nesema, varroa mites, favorite, digging in your hives too early, and so those are the topics. So we'll start here with starvation. So colonies can run out of food in the spring. Continue to check your colony's weight in food stores. Even after a nectar flow begins, bees won't be able to forage during cold or wet weather. Feed as needed. In the early spring, you can feed sugar syrup instead of dry sugar. So even though we're not really taking frames out of the hive and inspecting them right now, I can normally look in at the top of the box and see capped honey. So I like to see several frames with capped honey right now. Um, and then I also like to heft my hive, as Megan mentioned, to gauge its weight. And if I think that our, my bees are at risk of running out of food, I want to feed them food. All right, so tracheal mites are tiny mites that live in bee trachea. You can't see these mites without a microscope. They aren't a common problem in Michigan, but every now and then we hear of a case that may be related to tracheal mites. The telltale sign of tracheal mites is bees crawling outside of the hive. This is different than seeing dead bees in front of the hive. We expect to see dead bees outside of the hive. This is normal turnover of bees. If you think you have, your bees have tracheal mites, you can take videos of crawling bees. Megan and I would be interested to see them. Uh, you can take a sample of live bees and put the bees in your freezer until you're able to send it to a lab for diagnosis. Um, also, Megan can tell you about some YouTube videos that will teach you how to dissect bee trachea if you want to look for them yourselves. But again, this is not a common problem um, that we, we worry about. All right, so you can see bee poop for lots of reasons. Large amounts of bee poop can be associated with Nosema apis, which used to be common here, but now isn't detected here anymore. Um, it is not commonly detected. So the type of Nosema that is common in our area is Nosema serrani, and Nosema serrani isn't associated with signs of dysentery or bee poop in the hive. So we're sharing this because a lot of people get really freaked out because they'll see bee poop on frames, and they'll think that their bees have Nosema, and they'll get really worried, and we're telling you that the type of nosema that we have here isn't something that's associated with signs of dysentery or bee poop in the hive. Uh, nosema is really common in the spring. It normally clears up after feeding sugar syrup and, and nectar flow. Nosema isn't on the list of things that I worry about. There isn't much you can do and colonies can normally get better. You can sample your bees for nosema by sending them to a lab um, or you can learn how to analyze them self, yourself with a microscope. So here are some Nosema levels from MSU's yard at Kellogg Bird Sanctuary in Hickory Corners. The yard is part of the Bee Informed Partnership Sentinel Apiary Program, so we send samples of bees to the lab each month during the beekeeping season for analysis. In this yard, three of the colonies had elevated levels of Nosema in May, but the levels were low for the remainder of the beekeeping season without any targeted intervention. It's very common for Nosema levels to be high coming out of winter and then to clear up in the spring. All right, so I said that I don't spend much time worrying about tracheal mites or nosema. Varroa, on the other hand, is something that I spend a lot of time worrying about. You should make a plan for monitoring and managing varroa this year. When you are making spring varroa management plan, you should consider temperature, whether or not you'll have honey supers on, the amount of sealed brood in your hives, and your mite monitoring numbers from last fall. You may consider doing an early spring treatment. We know that in many cases, early spring treatments can help delay mite infestations. If you already have a mite management strategy in place for later in the spring, like a formic acid treatment or brood break during splits, then you may not need to do an early season treatment. A couple of contact-based treatments appropriate for early season include Apovar and Hopguard. Don't use Apovar if you have honey supers on. And remember, you must follow the label because the label is the law. MSU compiles trusted rural resources at keepbeesalive.org. On this page, you will find a web webinar recordings on how to monitor and manage varroa, handouts, and links to the Honeybee Health Coalition and other helpful sources. 
Another pitfall that we've touched on already is digging in your hive too early. The bees need to keep the brood nest above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Inspecting frames in the early season can harm your colony. We understand that you want to work outside in your bees and that you feel antsy, um, but next Dan is going to give you a list of things that you can do for your bees without digging in your hives. Do you want to stop for questions, Megan? Um, yeah, let's do a couple because there's a few things on um, the diseases and starvation. So um, there's a question about the bee poop association and I think it might just be a misunderstanding. So the question is why is bee poop associated with tracheal mite infection or with nosema? It should be a GI problem. Um, I think maybe if you can just talk about the other things that can cause the bee poop besides nosema? Sure, so, um, so yeah, to be clear, um, bee poop is not associated with nosema serrani, which is the nosema that we tech the most here, or with tracheal mites. There's other things that can cause dysentery or bee poop in your hive. Um, so some of it can be like fermented syrup or even a type of nectar that has a high ash content. Um, Megan, that's, uh, it might have other examples too, but there's reasons why maybe a colony would be trapped in a hive or um, not be able to forage or do cleansing flights and other reasons why they might poop in the hive. Yeah, I agree that it's often a food thing. And then the, it's almost found always with colonies that are really small. So just the fact that they're so small means that they can't get out to take a cleansing flight. So Dan mentioned in the beginning, like if you have a small colony, that's the thing, the smallness is what kills it, but we're concerned about why they're small. And a lot of times just the, the act of being small means that they're um, not functioning. Um, so then there's another question for starvation feeding. Are pollen patties better than sugar syrup? Um, for feeding, all right, so the question is, are protein patties better than sugar syrup? Yeah, so do you want to talk about why we need both? Starvation. Oh, sure. So uh, we, so protein is really important for larval growth, so we have a lot of brood developing right now, and that protein that comes from pollen or from protein patties is really important for the developing brood and the younger bees. The sugar syrup or honey or nectar are carbohydrates, and they're important for older bees, for them to have energy for foraging, and also for the bees to consume to have energy to um, cluster and thermoregulate. So we need both of those food sources at this time of year. Excellent. And then is it bad to continue to feed dry sugar instead of syrup um, is the question. But do you want to talk about what happens sometimes if you are feeding dry sugar at this time of year? Do you want to talk about? <laughs> I'll talk about it. <laughs> I, 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 um, so the, the syrup, the bees always prefer syrup. Um, over dry sugar. The only reason we use dry sugar is because we can't use syrup in the winter. But this time of year, if we put dry sugar in, a lot of times what happens is the bees will just spend a lot of work taking the dry sugar and just depositing it outside of the hive. So you'll be giving them like a workout, basically. Um, but they do need the moisture to, to use it and they don't readily eat it when it's just dry. Um, so syrup is definitely preferred. Um, and then the last question is, when will the bees start building comb? And I can take it if you don't want to. Yeah, so um, go ahead, but yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think we can. Um, so the, the bees, so as Anna mentioned that the most of the bees right now are going to be involved in nursing care, and there's a really in, especially in smaller colonies, like maybe everybody is involved in nursing care. And the thing that bees need to draw home is warm weather, wax, and, an, and to have a lot of bees that aren't involved in nursing. So that basically happens at the end of swarm season. So next talk, we're going to talk about like all the different ways you can make splits and how you deal with swarms. Once you get your bees together, um, then and like you get them all split and in line that's and the honey flows on that's when we start drying wax so we're ways off from that um there's a question on what ratio for sugar syrup at this time of year does it have to be one to one 
So one to one right now is the standard um, because that's similar in consistency to nectar. It doesn't have to be though. The yeah, that's that is the standard, but it's yeah, not a not written in pen. It's a it's a guideline. Yeah, you could definitely go heavier. Um, what should you do with the sugar bricks now if they haven't been completely consumed? If it's just pure sugar with a little moisture you've made to make bricks out of them, you can redissolve it and turn it back into syrup. Okay. And then um, our friends Lori and Kevin up north want to know, so when it is really cold and they're not, even though we, we've said that it's not worried about the syrup freezing, does it matter that the syrup is really cold? Um, is it better to replace syrup daily so they're getting warm syrup? No, so we wouldn't be replacing the syrup daily. So the bees can still access it when it's warm enough for them to break cluster. Excellent. All right, those are all the ones that I have on topic. Adam, do you have any? Actually, we just got one in. Um, so a question about protein powder, or, or powdered protein. Uh, he says the local farm store here does not carry any pollen patties. I read that you can use the powdered as long as the bees are flying. Is this something that we can, uh, can be placed inside of the hive on a shim near the syrup or with something over top of the bees to groom on? <coughs> Um, I can take that one. It, you can, so anytime you put a powder into the hive, the bees will often remove it. Um, it's better if, if you have the powder, which is totally fine, you just mix it in and make it kind of into a patty with some sugar syrup. Um, so if you can put something that has a little moisture in there and that gives them something that they actually have to take apart, um, they're more likely to actually consume it. All right, Dan, do you wanna get into the task list? Yeah, so we'll just talk to, we've kind of talked about what we're all anticipating and we all, we all do wanna get out there and, and get into them. Um, but just re remembering sometimes the best thing you can do is, is leave them alone. Um, and it's a little, just a little longer to contain that enthusiasm of spring. Um, and so just a couple things on kind of how you can, you know, scratch the beekeeping itch for, uh, you know, another couple weeks, month until we're really fully into the spring. Um, so one thing I'll plug, um, it's part of a project I work on, on uh, the Be Informed Partnership, and they do a national survey every uh, April, every year, where they get a lot of the national colony law statistics and um, management data. And when, when you'll see quoted in media articles that, you know, the, colony, the nation lost 38% of its bees last year. This is typically where it comes from. So log in, participate in that, open to anyone. Um, so just in, encourage you to participate in that. That's just started yesterday. It's open all of April. Um, so as far as, you know, what, what you want to be doing, you're thinking about this upcoming season, you know, you, you want to have a plan, but also kind of realize sometimes the only reason you have a plan is, is so you can change it. But think through kind of what you're, you know, what your goals are, what your needs are going to be. Successful beekeeping really is proactive beekeeping. It, you certainly can't anticipate every scenario you're going to encounter in a hive, um, but a lot of kind of the core management practices are, are very predictable. Um, you know, this, for a lot of you, this may be the first year that you've had colonies come through the winter. So if they've come through in good shape, they're going to need to be split. This may be the first time you're doing that. So there's a number of different ways we're going to we're going to talk about that in depth, you know, in the next webinar. Um, but it's just something, you know, you're going to, you're kind of advancing in your beekeeping skills and practices. So, so kind of be thinking, educating yourself on those. Definitely uh, mite management plan, um, as Anna mentioned, and something you'll keep hearing. That's a very strong message. And also keep in mind what worked for you last year, if you started with a package or a nuke may not be completely sufficient this year because an overwintered colony has very different brood dynamics. You know, we, we talked about your bees probably started brooding at some point in January or February. That means mite reproduction started. 
versus if you started with a package in April or May last year, that's a couple months later. So just, you know, really bear in mind, you, you want to be on top of that. And again, be proactive. Um, hopefully you're going to have some honey to deal with this year. Um, again, starting with a first year colony, you may not produce a lot. Your goals are to draw comb and get them established as a mature unit. So are you prepared to, to handle and extract honey? I mean, a, a good colony can make, you know, 50 pounds, 100 pounds if they're healthy and conditions are right. Not to count it before it's in the jar, but be prepared if it does come. Have a plan. Um, so th those sort of things are kind of on the planning stage. Um, you know, get prepared. You know, beekeeping involves a lot of, you know, supplies and equipment. It's kind of the time of year to take stock of what you've got. Do you have, you know, enough equipment if you're going to make splits? Do you have the appropriate amount of woodware to initially hive those new colonies and then also for their growth throughout the season so good time of year for cleaning maintenance building equipment um, you know if you need to purchase something the time to do that's now not when you get out there in june and realize you know they're bursting they're getting honey bound you need to put a super on and that's not the time to get the bee supply catalog out in order now is that time um, are your apiaries, apiaries in good condition? Um, you know, do you have room if you're going to leave a split there for another hive? Do you want a hive stand? Can you get your vehicle there year round? Just those sort of tidying up and that that prep work. So you know, take care of these things before you get into the bees. Um, great time of year for learning. We've all got that enthusiasm and want to get out there. Another kind of program to really promote here is this, this pollinator champions course from MSU. It's free, self-paced, online learning. A lot of us spending a lot of time at home, indoors now. Um, this is something you can work through. It's a great opportunity to kind of learn about pollinators, pollination, what you can do to help. Um, say that the course is free, you become certified, and if you want to then kind of get that certification to give presentations, um, it's a small $30 fee there to get kind of the course materials and, and become part of that program. But, free to take the course yourself. So really um, link here, check that out. It's a great resource. Um, and then kind of the, the, the last thing I would promote would kind of just to be observant, you know, something Adam mentioned early on about just your kind of responsibility as a farmer and a beekeeper is, is to, to pay attention to your environment and the weather and, and what's going on. Learn, you know, go for a walk, see what's blooming, um, you know, get, get to learn your plants not just what's blooming but if a couple things are blooming see what the bees are working you know they, they have preferences um so really you know get out there and, and kind of learn what's happening you know it's not just what's in your yard your bees will go for a couple two three mile radius so kind of learn that little local micro environment say looking up at the trees and you, you have maples and willows that are starting um you know if you know trees you might be able to identify some basswood that might come on later in the year so really get to know, you know, your immediate area. Um, you can learn, also learn a lot by looking, just observing the hive interest, non-disruptive, you know, there'll be some bee traffic. I, this, this uh, bottom left photo, I gotta say, I took that this afternoon, beautiful day where I'm at near Lansing, wanted to get out, the bees were flying good. Um, but again, gonna, don't want to poke around at them. So I was just watching them and all of a sudden these bees with this beautiful blue pollen started showing up. Got a couple photos and that sent me indoors to kind of start learning and asking, okay, what's this? And turns out it's a Siberian squill, which is a little, you know, kind of it's a bulb based plant that's up now. It's one of the early ones with the crocuses. So I learned something just today by not by poking in my hives, but by looking at them. You know, look around. Maybe you'll get some drones flying the first one of the season, those sort of things. So they just have that mindset of observational and, and kind of become, let the bees teach you. Um, All right. Thank you for that. Um, so just a couple notes. I just added two links to the chat. So the Bee Informed survey is there. Um, and then also the pollinators the pollinator champion course links are there so you can cut and paste them um, we'll also put them in the show notes for the webinar on our webinar page as we um, showed early so we have about uh, 14 more minutes to take some more questions i've got a couple here um, and people can add them if you want adam do you have any or do you want to go ahead with the ones that you have i think we're all set on our end here 
All right, that means we can get to the fun stuff. So people had done some completely unrelated ones here. Um, and I'm since we have some time, um, we'll deal with them. So Brent, who's a newbie, wants to know, he's seen some skunks around in my area, advice to prevent them from eating the bees. Dan, do you wanna take that? Yeah, so skunks do eat bees. Generally what they'll do, um, they're pretty well nocturnal or dawn and dusk anyways. Um, the, they'll come out and scratch at the entrance of a hive and the bees will kind of, guard bees will, will kind of come out and they'll pick them off one by one. Um, so one thing that, so sometimes you'll see either matted grass or if your hives are in fair dirt, you'll see kind of these little shallow divots in front of the hive where there's skunk activity. You may see some little bit of clawing on a landing board or something. Um, and also I found when I've had hives get under pressure from skunks, um, they do tend to get a little ornery because they're getting harassed most nights. So as far as prevention, um, there are kind of like a, they call it like a nail board or a tack strip. Basically it's a, you know, it's uh, exactly what it sounds like, a little piece of wood with a bunch of nails poking through that you put upright in front of the hive because that's, you know, that's where your skunk is gonna come in. So you're basically just physically deterring them from getting to the entrance of the hive. Um, so that's kind of the best, you know, non-lethal, just, just a deterrent, really. Excellent. And then, um, oh, this is my favorite question. Um, what kind of trees should I be planting now for the bees? And I'm really glad that you focus on trees and for planting, because this is another thing that everybody can absolutely do, and conservation districts are having their tree sales soon. Um, someone can speak to this. I'm going to copy and paste a link into the chat right now that is basically a whole page that we maintain on pollinator supportive trees and places that you can buy them. But if you guys have some favorites. I like basswood. Um, that's a good, you know, I, I like the honey from it. It's, it's a big tree. I, um, you know, maples, maples and willows are always good, as Adam mentioned. Those are some of the first ones, and those can be the most, um, you know, critical times for your bees when that little bit extra makes a difference. Um, but yeah, I'd say if it's trees for bees, that that is a fantastic resource. Um, I would yeah recommend you know, availing yourself of some of the information there and find something specific to your location. Yep. Yeah, and the, the best thing is something that's going to thrive in the area that you're putting it. But there's we've got tons of bee-friendly trees. Um, okay, so there's, let's see, oh, seeding. People are asking about um, planting horse pastures and things like that. If you go to the Michigan Pollinator Initiative page, there is a whole tab on pollinator planting. And it has options for how to make a pollinator friendly lawn, how to make a pollinator friendly garden, how to um, do large scale plantings like pastures, how to do trees, how to plant for native bees. Um, so there's definitely a lot of things that you can do. I'm glad you guys are reminding us um, of that. So there's a question about um, how concerned should I be about the two dogs around my hives if I'm setting them up later this month? So it sounds like we have a newbie. I'd say it depends on your dogs. Um, so sometimes dogs learn that they get stung maybe once and they learn to leave the hives alone and then some dogs just don't learn. Uh, so it depends on the temperament of your dog but you might want to create a space where your dogs can't get close to the hive. I would you definitely, to, oh go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say you, you want to avoid a situation where you have dog or any animal in confinement, like a kennel or something where it can't actually physically flee. That's exactly what I was going to say. If the dog can run, it usually just gets away with one sting. Um, but since we have time, um, my one dog who wags her tail a lot has only been stung on the butt because she wags her tail so that when bees come, she sits down and hides her butt underneath her because in her mind, bees only get you on the butt. So I can always tell when there's bees around because she's sitting really funny. Um, all right, another question for the first years. Um, so there's, there's a couple people who um, 
are asking about first year colonies and getting wax drawn. So the first thing, I'll, we have time to answer it here, but I do wanna say that we did answer this quite a bit in the last couple webinars, which I'm hoping to get posted by the weekend. Um, so if they don't start really building comb till the honey flow, then how do new packages um, make comb basically? And how do first year beekeepers get new comb? There's two of those questions. Adam, do you wanna to talk to that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, wax production is, is really something that's stimulated by resource availability. So resource availability, lots of bees, um, and also temperature. So there's got to be the right conditions. And what we talked about in the earlier lecture, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Megan, if you do want to see the lecture right now, it is available on Heroes to Hive's web, uh, Facebook page um, still. So you can do that there. But essentially during, with packages that we're dealing with, it's kind of an artificial situation that we're putting them in. We're expecting them to draw comb at a period in time when comb's not really what they're drawing. Um, so it is something that you as a beekeeper need to be conscious of is that those packages, especially if you're getting them early in the season, and I've actually heard that some Northern beekeepers are getting packages this weekend. Um, and so that's a little early in the season for some of our areas that are in Northern Michigan. And so you're going to have to make sure that, um, that they have some comb available to them. And so in that lecture, we talked about drawn comb being like a, you know, like, like gold. Uh, essentially, because a package cannot cluster on uh, just foundation alone. So we've got to make sure that they have what they need to draw a comb uh, during these periods. And that is food availability, warm temperature, and lots of bees. All right, Anna, do you want to do your online question? Sure. So um, we got a question from the online form. So if you go to our web page that Megan showed at the beginning for beekeepers and webinars. We have an online forum where you can submit questions ahead of time. So this question was um, asking about mason bees. So saying that they know that there are differences in behavior between mason bees and honeybees, um, but interested in raising mason bees and want to make sure that doing so will not have a negative impact on honeybees. So, um, Adam, do you want to address this question? And so one part of the question was, um, they said that honeybees are native. So maybe you can start with that part and then talk about mason bees or where to go for resources. Yeah, so uh, just to be clear, um, honey, European honeybees are not native to North America. They are an imported species into the United States. So mason bees being a native species are, are native and, um, but, you know, we t and we talked about this again back in a, a, one of the earlier lectures is that there's this analogy between like keeping chickens and pr trying to raise chickens to protect uh, endangered birds. And it's just not the same thing. So if you're, if you're thinking that you're going to raise honeybees to protect native bees, that's, that's not what, what you're doing. Honeybees are a managed organism. It's a very different role that they play in the landscape than a native bee. Now, mason bees are fantastic, and they are, they're great pollinators. They're, they're great native bees to have around. Um, but you're, you're, you, uh, and I think, just I'm, I'm reading the comment again here just one more time. Oh, just that you're not having a, nat a negative impact on native bees. Um, so, no, you're not having a negative impact on native bees. Um, oftentimes, when we are trying to support honeybees in the way of things like forage resources, pollinator habitat, we are also uh, uh, protecting by, by offering resources to those native bees as well. Awesome, thanks. And we have some information about planting for native bees on our website for planting. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to indulge the last two questions. Oh, a couple questions. Um, so someone just wants to know if they've ever had a swarm move into equipment this early. Um, I have had swarms move into equipment. I've never had a move in this early. The earliest that I've caught a swarm in Michigan um, is end of April, really. Um, I have had two calls for people who are out cutting down firewood and have found bee trees. So there maybe could be some cases where bees are in distress right now. Um, there's another question that says, if the cluster is maintained at 90 degrees, what temperature is normally found 
above the inner cover. Does anyone want to hit that one? Above the inner cover, I would think if we're talking out well outside of the range of the cluster, we're getting near, I mean, probably just a little bit warmer than ambient temperature uh, in that area. That's what yeah. I would venture. I would agree. Um, so then, and then the last one that I have, oh, so I also want to make a note that I did put the link into the chat for where these meetings are being posted again, so people can check that. Um, there's a question that says, since I have several frames of old comb that I probably need to call, what should they do with that old comb? Dan, you want to talk to that? I mean, mine usually ends up in the burn pile. Um, <laughs> again, it, it's, you can render wax from it. Um, you know, that's fine. It, it, anytime I've made attempts at rendering wax, it's a shockingly large amount of work for a small amount of wax at the end of the day when, um, and so it's something I, I kind of put in the, yeah, just, just call and, and burn. Um, yeah, that's, that's my preference. Yep. I agree. Burner compost. All right. The last question that I have, um, to, to close this out, it says, when is it okay to share resources amongst the hive? Um, for example, to give light hives capped honey frames from a hive with lots of leftover honey. Anna, do you want to do that one? Sure. So that would be some, you can give um, colonies that are light some honey as long as you're doing so on warm days when you're not breaking up the brood nest. So if you have a colony with tons of leftover honey that's capped and you can put it next to um, inside a, another hive without breaking up the brood nest and you're not doing too much manipulation of frames and moving them around, you can do it now. Um, it's easiest if you have a full box of extra honey because then you can just put it on top of the, of the colony that feels a little bit light and you don't have to even worry about frames. Excellent. So um, I just want to take a moment to thank everyone for sticking with us to the end and for taking all this time to learn about their bees. And we hope you guys all enjoy the nice weather if you have it. If not, have a great weekend and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone.